This week on Life and Faith. All Bashar has known his entire life is bullets, bombs, tear gas, those sounds in the background, that cacophony background noise is the soundtrack to his life. I didn't do a great job of it early on when I was a young consultant. We don't really know where consciousness arises from. Our culture is not always very good sometimes at preparing people for the rubbish their own motives may lead them towards. Welcome back to Life and Faith for another season. I'm Simon Smart. Bashara Awad was a child in Jerusalem when his father was killed almost in front of him during the Israel-Arab War of 1948. And the story of his life and that of his family provides a sobering portrait of life in Israel-Palestine during decades of war, tension and dashed dreams for those seeking a peaceful resolution to the conflict. Somehow, Bashara a Palestinian Christian and community leader, remains unbowed and forgiving and empathetic towards his opponents throughout. His story is told in the book Yet in the Dark Streets Shining, a Palestinian story of hope and resilience in Bethlehem. The co-author of the book is Mercy Aiken, an American who was a volunteer at the Bethlehem Bible College that Bashara founded, And as she got to know him, she realised this was a story that had to be told. Mercy was in Australia with the Palestine-Israel Ecumenical Network and came into the studio to talk about the book. I began the conversation by asking her about Palestinian Christians, a group that is very often forgotten when it comes to the Arab-Israeli conflict. That's exactly right. When people think about the conflict in Israel-Palestine, they generally think sometimes that it's a religious conflict between Jews and Muslims, and they forget about the presence of this ancient Christian community, which logically makes sense. They've been in the land where Jesus Christ lived. So they've been there from the beginning of Christianity. And so you decided to write this story. Uh, Why this man? How did it come about? Well, I came to Bethlehem Bible College in 2015, and I should say that Bashara is the founder of Bethlehem Bible College. Mm -hmm. I came from the United States to volunteer, and as I got to know Bashara and hear about his life, these casual things that he would just drop about his life and my mouth would just fall open, Mm -hmm. you know, as as I'm hearing these stories, and also just seeing the context that the college itself was existing in, and also learning about his very illustrious family, I realized that this was a really important story, and I felt that it could make an impact, helping people have more nuance and understanding regarding the situation in the Holy Land. Mm, That certainly does that. And in a way, his life story reflects this um, modern conflict so well. We'll come to that shortly. One of the commendations for the book says that this is a story that offers empathy to the voices and groans of Palestinians and then advocates for compassion, justice, and peace building. I thought that was a good summary of the book. Yeah, thank you. I liked that too. Yeah, it's definitely doing that, isn't it? It's sort of telling us something about the Palestinian story that I think in a way lots of people are just unaware of. Yes, I was certainly unaware of it Mm. growing up in the United States, and it wasn't until I went over there to live and experience it all firsthand and talk to Palestinians and Israelis that I really began to understand on a more personal level on the ground what life is actually like for Palestinians. And because their voices are often not invited into the conversation, and they're often talked about or explained by others, but not given opportunity to explain themselves, it just seemed to me very important to let Bashara tell his story and um, offer people an opportunity to hear from Palestinians themselves about what their life is like. We have such a polarized world in all sorts of ways and no more so than in this story. So true. Isn't that true? And so in a way, I think your telling of this story is at least trying to kind of bring some ways in which people might understand each other better. Exactly. Mm. Yes. And bring even some balance just to 
the narratives that we understand about the Holy Land. I don't think we can truly become advocates for peace and justice, which I hope many people listening would want to do that, mm-hmm. without hearing multiple narratives and understanding uh, in a fuller picture what's happening there. So in my view, it's very imperative that we listen to numerous voices from the Holy Land, and certainly the voices of Palestinians need to be invited into that conversation. One of the very striking things in the way his story is told is the way in which he, despite a whole lot of things which we'll come to, keeps on trying to have empathy for an opponent. Yes. And that is a really striking thing in this book. Yes, that deeply moved my heart as I was talking to him. And it wasn't just him, it was his family. His mother had the same attitude and she taught her children. She was a strong Christian and so her faith really informed how she responded to this conflict. And she taught her children to do the same. And you know, at this Bible college, I would hear these Christians wrestling with these scriptures from the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, Mm -hmm. and in a depth that I hadn't heard as a Christian myself growing up in the United States, mm. my community wrestle with these scriptures. So they're, they're at the forefront and they're taking the scripture very seriously. Yeah, these are very famous and very challenging uh, words of Jesus, right? Exactly. Calling people to love their enemies. Exactly. Pray for people who persecute yes. them. Yes. Blessed are the peacemakers. These sorts of things, which sound good, but they're a lot harder to put into practice. Very much so, mm. especially when you're actively suffering and your community is continuing to suffer. It's not just one event, it's things that continue to happen year after year, day after day, decade after decade. And seeing Bashar, the posture of his heart towards the Israelis and how he worked very hard to build relationship with them wherever he could and break down walls and forgive. And he just walked through the land in such a mild way, Mm. in such a gentle way in such a soft way. There's this phrase, walk softly. Mm. He would just walk softly through the land, walk softly through the checkpoint, kind of exuding this gentleness. And that was another aspect about Palestinians that I thought many people are not aware that there are Palestinians who embody this kind of gentleness and this kind of loving forgiveness and a posture of reconciliation. There are many Palestinians who don't take that posture, obviously, but there are many who do. I would say more who actually do. They're just not known. Yeah, and people could be forgiven for not knowing this in the sense that you don't get these stories told very often. Right. And so people haven't, don't have the interaction and so on. Let's, let's come to part of his story that would illustrate some of the ways in which he did need to be a person who either embraced an attitude of bitterness and resentment and retaliation or something different from that. So early in the story, when he's a small boy, the British pull out of the region in 1948. The fighting begins. Uh, His family is forced out of their home. There's all this struggle around them. And his father is killed by a sniper when he's going out looking for food for the family. Very close to his dad. It's obviously a very devastating thing. This is a defining moment in his life, is it not? Yes, 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 absolutely. I mean, it changed the whole course of the life of this family. The children had to actually dig a grave to bury the father, their beloved father, their protector in the backyard. Yeah, they couldn't go anywhere else because of so much fire. Right, they were were stuck in their home in Mm. no man's land. And then they had to flee their home, so they never even got to visit his grave again or anything. But it was their mother, Huda, who was such a strong woman of faith. And one of the most powerful things, I think a gift she gave to her children, because they were trying to figure out who killed their father. And most of them thought the direction the bullet came, it was probably from the Zionist Jewish forces. But the mother took this position. We don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. It could have been a stray bullet from the Jordanian side. And she did this because she didn't want them to harbor a sense of vengeance Mm -hmm. and hatred in their heart. And so I think with this deep wound that the whole family experienced collectively with the death of their father, Elias, Huda was right there kind of pouring this oil into the wound on the other side, Mm -hmm. giving them opportunity and leading by example about forgiveness and about love and about looking forward in life. Like, we're not going to sit here and wallow. We're still people who are here on this earth, and we have a purpose to be here on this earth. And this is while she obviously felt 
that deep wound herself. Right. Yeah, I don't obviously. know how she did it. Mm. I really don't. But mm. she was an incredible woman. I wish I could have met her. He doesn't pretend, though, that even though he sort of was able to kind of mouth kind of Christian ideas yeah. of forgiveness, he doesn't pretend that actually deep down he felt it. Right. He says he has this deep anger that kind of builds up over many years that he's sort of, in one sense, almost subconsciously. Yes. And then eventually he has this very dramatic moment where he feels his interaction with God enabled this deep sense of a different approach. Yes. So that was just amazing, actually. Yeah. It was a real turning point in his life. He was living in a little community north of Bethlehem or west of Bethlehem, Beit Jala. Yeah. And he was principal of a little Christian school there, a little Mennonite school. And the boys were being sometimes arrested in the middle of the night by the Israeli army. Maybe they were throwing stones. Maybe they weren't. It wasn't always clear. But this rage and this anguish began building up in Bashar, which he had stuffed way down in mm. his soul. Because he's a very mild man and very sweet. And he hid it. He hid his pain from himself. And suddenly these memories that he had stuffed to the back of his mind began coming to the forefront of how he then had to grow up in an orphanage because his father was killed and their family was refugees and his mother was destitute and all the trauma from his own childhood and now he's seeing it revisited upon the next generation and he reaches this breaking point where he realizes he has to actually pray something real and true and not just recite a nice platitude. So he has this very dramatic encounter with God, <laughs> basically, in his principal's office. And he begins to see this vision of Jesus Christ and his love for all people. And it somehow, it was just, I would say miraculous in a way. It was just a miraculous encounter with God, but it healed something in his heart where he was able to forgive genuinely from his heart with great tears and with great emotion. And that's what enabled him then to begin more of this conciliatory approach than reaching out in love to Israelis. And also it enabled him to be a more effective member of his own community because he wasn't weighted down with the same bitterness. So he was able to start bringing peace for others. Early in the book, he describes the growing violence between Arab resistance to Jewish immigration. And he says it seemed that there was violence and retaliatory violence that had become the new reality and had known nothing else. And yet his family becomes this family who pray for, I think you're right about the mum seems to be such a driver of this, but pray for not only their own people, but for people on the Israeli side. Yeah. There's precious little of this kind of attitude isn't there and a really important sort of circuit breaker perhaps to this sort of endless cycle that we yes, see. Yes, yes. I mean as someone who's a Christian myself mm. when I'm observing these Palestinian Christians and what they're doing it was almost like I encountered my faith all over again like yeah. oh this is actually what we're supposed to do. Right. This is part of my faith like this is a central piece of it and I don't think my community really practiced that enough. There's an amazing story where the family were huddled in there. This is around 1948 and all the fighting's beginning. They're in their home, terrified about bombings and so on, and they all rush to the corners of the room, and, and they describe this projectile coming through the window and through the front door and then exploding outside yeah. of it. I mean, you know, that's just an amazing event, I guess. But all of this helps you to feel the kind of tenuousness of life, the preciousness, but also how fragile it is in that part of the world. And they kind of live with this for so many decades, right? So many decades. Mm. I mean, when I look at Bashar's life, I'm like, this is what he knew even before 1948. It was so much violence going back and forth in the city yeah. as the British mandate was there. And they were trying to speak one thing to the Arab population, speak another thing to the Jewish population. And, you know, there's just violence coming up and they're trying to press it down. And all Bashar has known his entire life is bullets, bombs, mm. tear gas, those sounds in the background, that cacophony background noise is the soundtrack to his life. Yeah, which makes his sort of life all the more remarkable, I think. Um, he goes to the U.S., uh, a good experience there, right? But he's he's struck by the lack of acknowledgement of 
the Palestinian people who had thousands of years of history in, in the area, and he couldn't understand that, could he? That was a real shock to him. Yeah, and Palestinian Christians talk about this a lot because generally when people come up to them, they say, oh, you're a Christian. When did you convert? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, mm. assuming that they were Muslim uh, yeah. or Jewish perhaps. And a Palestinian Christian, they usually give this line back now, 2,000 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and I think they're continually surprised that the rest of the world isn't aware of that. But, you know, I wasn't aware of that growing up in the United States. I never heard about this community. And it only makes sense, you know, as I said earlier, this is the land where Jesus Christ was born and died and resurrected. And why wouldn't there be Christians there? Duh. (laughs) Yes, although there's a lot less than there were once, isn't it? That's true. It's a diminishing population. That's true. Only about 1% of the population in Israel Palestine is now Christian. And 100 years ago, 150 years ago, it would have been more like 10%. I remember the Jordanian king once making a comment about the Christians in that region being the glue that holds a lot of this together. Does that reflect anything of the experience you've had in being there and then writing this book? I hadn't heard that, but I'm Mm. happy to hear that quote because Mm. that has been my observation. Palestinian Christians punch far beyond their weight in terms of impact in society. They are very engaged, very active. They show a lot of leadership in all of the qualities that anybody would want in any society, from education, just building up the community, reaching out. And there's many Muslims who do and many Jews who do. Please don't get me wrong on that. But yeah. being such a small population, as I said, they just punch far beyond their weight. Mm-hmm. And I've heard other people say, it. even Muslims have told me this in Bethlehem, the Christians add a special strength, like we need them here. We want them here. So I say all this because the tragedy that they're disappearing from the land Even more so now, since October 7th, the Christian population is draining out even more Mm -hmm. and will probably be gone from Gaza by the time this war is over. There's a thousand Christians about who live in Gaza, Mm -hmm. and I don't think any of them will be there when it's all done. Life and Faith from CPX, and I'm speaking with Mercy Aiken, the co-author of Yet in the Dark Streets Shining, a Palestinian story of hope and resilience in Bethlehem. This book tells the life story of Bashara Awad and his family living in Jerusalem and then Bethlehem under occupation and amidst the struggle there. Bashara spends several years in America but he feels the pull of his homeland and eventually returns and starts up a school in Bethlehem and then a Bible college. I asked Mercy, what was Bashara hoping would be the impact of that? And what was the impact? Because of this Christian drain from the land, Bashara began to lament every year when they would have their graduating class from the Hope High School, the best and brightest students would leave Those who felt called to theological education or leadership of any kind, they needed to go abroad to get their education, and most of them never returned. So it was this brain drain and this leadership drain, particularly within the Christian community, but within Palestinian society at large. And this conundrum, I mean, became a pain and a burden in his heart. And he felt like, this is my call to try to do what I can to stem this tide and encourage people to stay here. So he called together a meeting of Christian leaders in Bethlehem and Jerusalem area, from Orthodox to Catholic and different Protestants. And they all agreed, we need to have some kind of higher education here. So they basically created this interdenominational Bible college, which Bashar became the president of and the chief fundraiser for and the face of and voice of. And it has done a lot to offer hope for Palestinian Christians in particular, but they also serve Muslim students to stay in the land and to be, as we say, salt and light. Uh, That's a phrase that Jesus gave us, to be salt and light. And so that's what they feel called to do. And the students who go to the Bible college, most of them make a choice to stay in the land 
even though it's far more difficult to stay in their homeland, and many of them have better opportunities elsewhere in the world. But it's a sacrificial choice that they make because they care very deeply about their community, their country, their homeland, and also their identity as Palestinian Christians with this very great and long tradition. Bashar is brother at the 40th anniversary of the Bible College a few years ago, Alex Awad. He remarked that it would be a, a shameful thing for the Holy Land to be without an indigenous Christian presence. And he called on the global church also to help engage to prevent this drain from continuing. His other brother spent a lot of time in the U.S. and came back to his homeland determined to implement some of the strategies he'd seen in the civil rights movement right. there of nonviolent resistance. Tell me a bit more about that. Yeah, so his little brother Mubarak, mm. he also got a scholarship to go to the United States, but he was placed in a college down south in Tennessee, and this was at the height of the civil rights movement. And Mubarak never went to really follow the rules, began inviting black friends that he was making. He would go to these black churches. He loved it. And he'd mm. invite them to come to his campus, which was not integrated. And he kept getting in trouble. And he just got very disgusted. But he loved Martin Luther King. And as he would listen to him, his heart resonated like, this is what we need to do in Palestine. So in the 80s, he returned to Palestine to start the Center for Nonviolence. And his whole vision was to go around the countryside teaching Palestinians how to organize nonviolently. Mm -hmm. So if their land, a farmer, you know, his land is taken by the Israeli army saying, this is our land now, no. Mubarak would help them to nonviolently resist. The olive trees got uprooted. We're going to go plant them again. And just, you know, non-cooperation, because at this point the West Bank is now under the Israeli military occupation, which started in 1967. So that's when Mubarak's ideas really began to take hold. And he was eventually deported by Israel because of his nonviolent organizing. But the seeds that he planted for that led to the nonviolent organizing that led to the first intifada, which is essentially why he was deported. Yes, gosh, nonviolence. Seems like a good option, doesn't it? Now, yeah. and and I want to know a bit about the impact on you of, you know, coming from the U.S. Then the experience of being in Bethlehem, and then obviously soaking in this story for such a long time. How's that affected you in your life? You know, I think some of the things that I mentioned earlier about seeing how Palestinians lived their Christian faith in a way that felt more relevant in some ways to the harsh reality of the world. Mm. You know, I'm from North America. I'm white. I grew up in a lot of privilege that I think my community doesn't even really recognize the extent of the privilege that we have. And it was only when I began to live with other people who shared my faith who were living it from the underside of power and how that shaped the way that they looked at the world and how it shaped how they read the Bible and how they lived their faith. And it it actually made me want to be a Christian all over again. Mercy, when you think of the hopes of Bashara and your own hopes, actually, as you've engaged in this work, and then consider what happened on October 7, where does all of that leave you? What happened on October 7th was so tragic and so heartbreaking. It's still hard to, when I put myself in the shoes of my Jewish friends, it's still hard for me to get my mind and heart around it. I have a friend whose son was killed on that day. He was a soldier down at the border. He was one of the first people who died. And I remember when I texted her, I said, how are you doing? And she just texted back, my son died today. So I feel this personally because I have friends on both sides of the wall. It doesn't justify whatsoever the violence that Hamas enacted on that day on those innocent Israelis, many of them who were the cutting edge of the Israeli peace movement in those kibbutzim. Mm -hmm. These were people who were activists for Palestinians, actually, many of them, which makes it doubly tragic. So when I think about the story, this very hope-filled story, and I think about the peace workers 
that I have met and who I've come to love and admire so much in the land, whether they're Christian, Muslim, Jewish, or even people of practicing no faith at all, they to me are the leaders of the future. These are people who have been involved in this peace work for decades through ups and downs and ins and outs, and they have the stamina to continue advocating for justice, for peace, for reconciliation, for hope for a better future. Yes, they declare there are ways we can mend this land. We can live together side by side in peace. We can do it. And they, they show us repeatedly that it is possible. There is a different future that has always been possible in Israel and Palestine. But, you know, extremist leaders, and they are all over the place in that land from every population, those people have unfortunately been in the driver's seat for too long. And as a result, we're now looking at the complete tragedy and chaos of the land. But I, in, in the despair of that, knowing now that the work, the peace work that so many people have tirelessly been engaged in, knowing now that it is set back for decades, probably, we don't even know how long because many of the people who, who were edging more towards still wanting to form some kind of reconciliation work, many of those people are, are saying, forget it. So it's only the really committed people who are left. But I still believe that the strength the sort of moral strength and truth and light is with these people. And so my hope is, as a person of faith, that that is what will ultimately prevail in that land. This has been Life and Faith with me, Simon Smart. Thanks to Mercy Aiken for our conversation today. Mercy is the author, along with Bashara Awad, of Yet in the Dark Streets Shining, a Palestinian story of hope and resilience in Bethlehem. Mercy was in Australia with the Palestine-Israel Ecumenical Network, which is a network of Australian Christians and supporters seeking lasting peace and justice for the people of Palestine and Israel. You can see their website in the show notes. I'm sure you can think of someone who would appreciate this episode, this story being as pertinent as ever. Please do share it with someone you know. Now, Life and Faith is just one of the things we do here at CPX. To connect with more of our content, you can sign up to our newsletter at publicchristianity.org. We'd love to see you do that. And also get in touch with us here about the podcast at podcast at publicchristianity.org. We'd really love to hear from you. A big thanks today to our producer who does such great work on this podcast, the perennially peaceful Alan Dalfate. Next week. Dementia is a disease. Dementia is terminal. I don't want to sugarcoat that. And dementia does much more than simply affect memories. So there is real grief, real trauma, real suffering 